our number one enemy is ignorance. Um, and I believe that is the number one enemy of everyone. Uh, is not understanding what is actually going on in the world. It's only when you start to understand that you can make effective decisions and effective plans. Now, the question is, who is promoting ignorance? Well, those organizations that try to keep things secret, um, and those organizations which distort true information to make it false or misrepresentative. In this latter category, um, it is bad media. Um, it, it really is my my opinion that the media in general are so bad we have to question whether the world wouldn't be better off without them altogether. They're so distortive to how the world actually is um, that the result is we see um, wars and we see corrupt governments continue on. One of the hopeful things that I've discovered is that nearly every war that has started in the past 50 years has been a result of media lies. The media could have stopped it if they had searched deep enough, if they hadn't um, reprinted government propaganda, they could have stopped it. But what does that mean? Well, that means basically populations don't like wars. And populations have to be fooled into wars. Populations don't willingly, with open eyes, go into a war. So if we have a good media environment, then we'll also have a peaceful environment. Julian Assange, thank you very much. United Nations Article 19, the right to receive and impart information in any medium across frontiers. Hello, Sydney, can you hear me? Thank you so much, Julian. Thank you. Well, finally, 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 this 14-year abomination has come to an end and it's come to an end only because of your determination, the determination of citizens around the world, uh, the dedication of his family, the persistence of the Greens and the independents in Australia who were there right from the beginning, as was the amazing Jennifer Robinson. And, of course, in the end, it took a Prime Minister who was prepared to push for a resolution. We're all looking forward to welcoming Julian and his family back to Australia. And that hopefully will happen when he starts to recover from the ordeal that he's been through. He's emerged into a very different world, a world where war crimes and crimes against humanity are being committed daily in full view of the world for the first time and with impunity. The work of those of us who want peace with justice and journalism that holds power to account has to continue and it will continue. I really want to congratulate those of you who recognised the value of Julian's achievement. Julian and his work have been etched into history. But you recognised the significance of that achievement and the person, the principal person who was behind it. You saw through attempts to discredit him and diminish the value of that work, which was driven by the very principles that we all adhere to and that will drive our work going forward. So stay strong. And congratulations, we've won a huge battle. Yeah! Oh! We did it! We did it! Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for being so patient. My name is Ian Rose. I'm filling in for Mary Costakidis, who has had a sudden emergency. So we wish her all well. The plan of Julian Assange has been going on for 14 
and a half long, long years. There's people in this room that have been involved for all those 14 and a half. I've only done 13 and a half myself. But I'm really glad that five years ago, when you got taken out of the embassy, masses of people came to the fore. In, and this is, I'm talking about the global network, grassroots movement. But in this city alone, we had one support assignment group. We suddenly had four. Yeah? Like that is a massive injection into the campaign. And that's what happened. And it's been happening like that throughout. That was a big one. But the big thing that's happened, the really big thing that's happened, is that people from all around the world have formed these global networks of people power. This was a global movement that we were a part of. We played our part to our extent as they did to theirs. And we got the job done. There are three more campaigns coming up. Pardon Assange, addressing the media bullshit. The Pardon Assange is the big one. Addressing the media bullshit is an important one, and the other one is challenging the war profiteers. Why aren't the war criminals in jail? They're even called into question. Our next speaker is Kim Stanton. You all know he's the maker of the Trust Board. Yeah. One of my favourite quotes of Julian, let me um, share this with you. Uh, you know, I've shared these uh, thoughts with many of the sessions we've attended. Uh, more than 2,000 sessions of the Trust Fall in Australia, New Zealand, UK. Uh, it's coming out in the US in two weeks, the 17th of July. Um, so, you know, my partner, co-producer Natalia Mignana and I, we've attended some of the sessions and, and I do a little introduction and share this quote because I say to the crowd, uh, Julian, he's not just an encryption expert, a geopolitics expert, he's also a visionary, a philosopher. He had a vision and he followed through on that. And, uh, you know, we, when we started this project, uh, it was going to be a, a three-month, zero-budget YouTube documentary. That's what we were going to do. And somehow it turned into a, a you know, worldwide, half-a-million-dollar budget, you know, somewhat of a blockbuster documentary. Uh, and that was thanks to people power uh, and that was a democratic process of people wanting to see a new Assange film uh, made in the way that we made it. So this is one of my favourite quotes of Julian. There is unity in the oppression and there must be absolute unity and determination in the response. End quote. Yeah, 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 unity! And so this project was an incredible um, result of incredible unity. Thousands of people contributed to our crowdfunding campaign. We had 25 investors, uh, 23 videographers, three editors. It was a one-year process, a thousand hours of editing to make this very long, very intricate film. Uh, five animators, uh, and, and most of all my lovely partner Natalia who was there all throughout the process from carrying heavy camera equipment in the subways of London through to uh, translating the interviews of the uh, Spanish doctor, Pau Perez Sales, uh, designing the poster that carried the film around the world. And uh, she's been with me the whole way through and, and just been a wonderful asset. If you're ever going to make a documentary, I re highly recommend Find Yourself and Natalia. So, you know, when we got this wonderful news, I, I didn't initially believe it because I've trained myself to not believe mainstream media, right? And uh, so it, it took a few hours for the penny to drop. And uh, we happened to be on the way to Canberra. The film was showing at the NFSA in Canberra on Tuesday night last week, and uh, we were just there. I mean, what's the chances of that? And we, managed, we, we were there to see him arrive at the RAAF hangar uh, and, you know, just one of the few people to witness that incredible moments. So I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, obviously this changes the context of the film. It doesn't stop us sharing it because this is a powerful story. It's an important story that everyone needs to understand. And, and look, let's face it, most people are only still uh, starting to grasp it. It's, it's actually a result of this incredible exposure of his freedom that a lot of people are going to actually have a look at what was this about in the first place and what is WikiLeaks and what did they disclose. Um, so this is a wonderful opportunity that we can actually uh, have a new audience come in and uh, watch the film, learn about this story and learn from it. Um, so, you know, we're excited about that. We're going to keep pushing it out there. And, uh, but, we, you know, we might have to make a few changes to the film. We've realised that, so especially the timeline and, uh, 
and, uh, and, and for those that have seen the film, um, you, you might remember this last part of the film about where the trust for the title starts to make sense. Um, and so I've been toying around with options of what to say, how to change that last bit in the context of Julian now being free. So uh, I'll just, um, I'll, I'll read, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, recite that last bit of the film and I'll show you one of my ideas of how we're gonna change it. If there is a sign on the right side of history, it already has the words Julian Assange engraved on it. If there is a gong in the theater show that was his trial, its metal is split from being rung so loudly. And if there is a bird that is about to take flight, stretch her wings and rule the skies, may it be a peace dove and no longer a bald eagle. If he had a river of leaks on his computer screen revealing their felonies and the choice of whether to publish them. If he knew that they are rich, angry old men capable of hideous acrimony and vengefulness. If he knew that they would chase him to the ends of the earth. If he knew that the hands of the many united are strong enough to move mountains. If he knew that we have an ability to realize that we've been deceived, to finally and critically and profoundly and devastatingly open our eyes, then this was a trustful, an incredibly brave trustful, and we were the ones who were there to do the catching. That's just one, one way we might uh, adjust the film so that it's a, a timeless reminder and people can watch it in a thousand years from now. Watch The Trustful and it will be a horror story that they are watching uh, and a lesson for everyone to learn. Uh, the second thing I want to read is a, film, a, a poem called Thank You. And uh, I've, I've not yet met Julian. We couldn't interview him. We weren't allowed to interview. And no journalist allowed into the prison at, at that time. Um, so this is what I wrote in regards to my hopes to one day meet the uh, subject of the film. One day I hope to meet this man, this brave David who took on a Goliath of an empire. This warrior who threw his own body like a spanner into their wretched war machine. This genius who used his smarts to invent an anonymous dropbox to protect those reporting crimes. This engineer who designed a pipeline for a torrent of truth, this peacekeeper who showed us that mon wars are all built on lies, this messenger who built an indestructible and immense and mighty rebel library of Alexandria. What would I say if I met this man? First, thank you, and then, sorry. Thank you for your contribution to progress, knowledge, and peace, and sorry for being so ignorant and taking so long to acknowledge the weight and value of your contribution to humanity. And this last one, uh, I wrote just the day after we watched him arrive in, uh, at Canberra Airport. It was a freezing night, Natalia and I were there and uh, we didn't feel the cold at all. We were so excited. It was just an amazing sight to see him get out of the plane, pump his fist and uh, walk up the tarmac. Um, so, and uh, something I said in the trust for was wherever Julian goes, free speech goes with him. Yeah. So this is called free speech. Free speech just chartered a flight and flew 11,000 miles over the Pacific Ocean. Free speech just touched down with a whiff of burnt rubber to a cheer that resonated around the world. Free speech just popped his head out of a door into fresh air, pumped a fist and smiled a smile as big as the moon. Free speech just lit a fire to melt the frost of a journalistic ice age. Free speech just crossed a tarmac and briskly ended a hell of a long walk to freedom. Free speech just strode into the massive hug of his loved ones and hoisted his wife off her feet. Free speech just raised two triumphant arms and gave a thumbs up to a cheering crowd. Free speech just checked into a hotel and slept on a real bed for the first time in years. Free speech just woke up and admired the sun rising on a horizon of promise. Free speech just drank 
a good coffee and ate a piece of real bread with the finest quality peanut butter spread thick with possibilities. So as, as Carl Leinhardt, the singer-songwriter whose song we used at the end of the film, said, we're going to keep pushing, we're going to uh, pardon Assange and keep campaigning the more, for the more than 500 journalists in prison around the world today. We'll keep showing the trust fall. If you'd like to support that, we've got these, uh, my little poetry book on sale tonight, uh, pay-as-you-feel donation, and you can take one home and explore further the uh, ideas and insights behind the film. Um, thanks for having me here tonight. And well done, everyone, for their efforts to get this heroic journalist free. Thank you. Joe Laurier is the next speaker. As the editor-in-chief of Consortium News, he's also a former UN correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, and other newspapers, including the Montreal Gazette, the London Daily Mail, and the Star of Johannesburg. He was an investigative reporter for the Sunday Times in London, financial reporter for the Bloomberg News, and began his professional work as a 19-year-old stringer for the New York Times. I'll tell you what, that's Amazing. He's also the author of two books, The Political Odyssey, with uh, Senator Mike Gravel, forwarded by Daniel Ellsberg, and How I Lost by Hillary Clinton, forwarded by Julian Assange. He's editor-in-chief of Consortium News, who are doing the live stream for us tonight. Thank you so much. The Assange campaign has been able to rely on CN for its consistent and regular reporting, strongly countering the bullshit from the mainstream SM. Now, I can't stress this enough. Now, I know there's a lot of agencies out there, Counterpunch and so on, Canary and what have you, but CN, they have given us the most meat. So when we're looking back, we can almost see day by day, whereas these other guys are week by week. But they're all good. No, don't miss, everybody can just do what they can. These two have managed to do a lot. So, let's make him feel welcome. Come on, everybody. A big, big cheer for Joe Laurier. Thank you, Ian. <clears throat> yes, indeed, I'm going to sit down. I tell you, it hasn't really sunk in yet. Um, I, I, it's hard to believe because we, for so long, most of us, I think, thought he would wind up for the rest of his life in an American dungeon and die there. And why did we think that? Because we saw so many irregularities in this case uh, that judges in Britain let go. Uh, for example, the spying, the 24-7 spying directly to the CIA. The fact that the spying included on his com privileged conversations with his lawyers, his doctors examining him. This was all uh, the government that was prosecuting him, the intelligence agency of that government, was spying on the communications he was having with his lawyer. Any other case, that would have been thrown out immediately. And this wasn't. The British courts kept accepting all of these irregularities. And you couldn't help but think this was a political case completely from the very beginning. For example, Judge Vanessa Bareza in the lower court in the extradition case, September 2020, she ruled when she said he should not be extradited for health reasons, but agreed with all the other arguments of the United States. She ruled that the First Amendment guarantees that were required by the European Convention on Human Rights to which British extradition law is, is bound, that that would be settled in the US. Had she asked the US then for an assurance on the First Amendment and not gotten one, as happened just a few months ago, this case could have ended four years ago. But nonetheless, this is a victory, one of those rare victories that you don't think you're going to win. And this reminds me of a, a quote from I.F. Stone, an American independent journalist from starting in the 1940s and 50s, very famous. Uh, he said, the, quote, the only kind of fights worth fighting are those you're going to lose because somebody has to fight them and lose and lose and lose until someday somebody who believes as you do wins. And this is what happened. So this is a lesson about the odds seem completely against us, but you keep speaking what you believe in keep organizing against it, and you might just win. And this was, of course, a deal that was in the works for at least nine months, the plea agreement. And I want to just ask, why? Why did it happen? Why did it happen now, finally? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Certainly pressure from world leaders, like Obrador, the president of Mexico, who spoke directly to Biden, Lula, 
and other leaders, including uh, kicking and screaming, brought into this Anthony Albanese. He did not really want to say much about this. He kept putting it off. Penny Wong said, well, we can't interfere in the judicial processes of foreign nations, even though Australia had done that at least three times to get back people from Iran and Egypt and Cambodia. So it was total rubbish. Finally, Albanese did press him, Biden, that is. I don't think that was the deciding factor at all. There was also, of course, human rights groups, press freedom groups all over the world that eventually joined this fight. And of course, public pressure from activists like all of you here. This all worked together to bring this. But there was one decisive factor. And, and that was that the United States realized around April 4th, this year, just a couple of months ago, that they were going to lose this appeal in the high court in London. Now, how do we know this? They were going to lose because the Washington Post reported that on April 4th, there was an email. And the email, I'm quoting from the Washington Post from last week, quote, the urgency here has now reached a critical point. Quote, a Justice Department trial attorney wrote, in an email dated April 4th, seen by the Washington Post, back to the DOJ in Washington. The urgency has reached a critical point. Quote, the case will head to appeal and we will lose. That's, it. That's what the US trial attorney told the Department of Justice on April 4th, because they knew they could not deliver this assurance about First Amendment protection for Assange, without which the British court could not extradite him. As I said, that could have been done four years ago by Beresa, but it wasn't. But this is what sprung him. They could not satisfy that demand of the court. And that was exactly the reason why we learned from this Washington Post article that the British judges, James Lewis, QC, now KC, and um, Claire Dobbin, they actually said this, and this is also from another email. The lawyers representing the U.S. government concluded they would run into, quote, an ethical obligation to drop the case because of, quote, their duty of candor. They could no longer argue for extradition when a condition required by the court had not been met, the condition being the First Amendment assurance. So the British, they were going to quit. The British lawyers would not go forward and represent the U.S. government in this appeal. The United States was left with nothing to do but salvage something. They did not drop the case. They moved on a plea agreement that had been lying there on the desk of an assistant attorney general in Washington, a deal that had been worked on for nine months. They moved on this at the last minute. And I want to add this. If this, he had been extradited to the United States, to the court in the Eastern District of Virginia, Alexander, Virginia, where I live eight minute drive away from there, I'm very glad I don't have to make that drive to his extradition to his trial, he would have lost in the US because everything in the indictment is gone from this plea deal. There's no longer a hacking allegation. There's no longer talk about him endangering informants, which is all we heard in that extradition case from Lewis and the others, ad nauseum that he put people in danger. It's gone. It's gone. The only thing he had to plead to was something he technically did do wrong. As he said, he honestly pled guilty to unauthorized possession or a conspiracy to commit unauthorized possession and dissemination of defense information, which the Espionage Act, as it is now written, does make illegal. It's not only illegal for government officials who sign non-disclosure agreements when they handle classified information, they, it applies to everyone, and this is the problem with the Espionage Act, that part of it. That is clearly unconstitutional against the U.S. Uh, First Amendment. When you sign the NDA, you're signing away your First Amendment rights. But a journalist, even an American one, a British one, an Australian one, has not signed a non-disclosure agreement. They have every right to receive that information and publish it. And even though the, all the law is written that way, and it's always been an option for governments, this was only the third time that a US administration tried
to indict the publisher of the information of the journalist. The first was FDR in 1942 against the Chicago Tribune because they published a story saying that the US had broken the Japanese code in the Battle of Midway. The second time was Richard Nixon. In 72, he tried to go after the New York Times reporters for publishing the Pentagon Papers. They couldn't exercise prior restraint or censorship. They couldn't stop the New York Times from publishing. But once they did, the US had the option of, of of indicting a journalist. And both times it collapsed. In Chicago, with the Tribune, the grand jury refused to indict, very likely because of the First Amendment. And in Boston, for the Pentagon Papers case, it was discovered that the FBI had been tapping Dan Ellsberg's phone, therefore also the New York Times reporters, because they were speaking to him on the phone. So the case collapsed. This is the only time a journalist was successfully indicted. But they couldn't go through with it because, again, the First Amendment stopped them. So what we need here is the, that part of the Espionage Act to be appealed, to go to the Supreme Court in the United States and to say, to judge that this is unconstitutional. The Supreme Court in the US is a constitutional court. It could decide this is unconstitutional and order the Congress to change the law. And right now, there are um, amendments put forward by Rashida Tlaib, a congresswoman from Michigan, who said, uh, who put forward amendments to the law that among other things would, would uh, differentiate between journalists or anybody and those government officials who signed a non-disclosure agreement. That's not gonna happen. One bad thing about the plea agreement is Julian agreed to waive his right to appeal. They got that from him in exchange for his freedom and his admission that he'd broken that technical clause. And by the way, in the court, he said, I thought the First Amendment protected me. So he was saying, yes, I broke the law, but the law is wrong. That's what he said. And the law needs to be changed, but he cannot appeal. He also signed away any uh, right to sue the US government, because an option would be a civil lawsuit against the United States to say that he was wrongly brought to this plea agreement because the, the law as it's written, the Espionage Act, is wrong, is unconstitutional. So he can't do any of that. Funny enough, if you read the agreement, the judge in the court in Saipan in the North Mariana Islands, she said uh, uh, the, the deal was that the US government agreed if she didn't accept the plea and dismissed it, he would walk free and he wouldn't have had any uh, conviction as he now has. So she didn't, she accepted the plea deal, he's free. And let's just hope that he's free and safe in Australia. Because Penny Wong gave this warning, or was it just a bone thrown to the opposition? As we know, the coalition is, is making a big deal, the Albanese called him when the uh, first person to call Assange. You know, pure politics, absolute rubbish, especially when Dutton, the opposition leader, had agreed with uh, Albanese to, to do a deal and to get him out. But Penny Wong said this, we have laws in Australia in relation to national security information. We expect those laws to be observed by all citizens and by all entities. That's our position. Julian has to be careful here. You can, a journalist here can be prosecuted for publishing information. As we saw almost in that case of Dan Oaks and the ABC, they, they could have, but the AFP decided, well, the Attorney General decided not to, but it could. So I just, just to warn you and leave you with, the last thing I'm gonna say is, two men that I had great pleasure in knowing who were on the board of Consortium News and who worked so hard for Julian to be free. Unfortunately, we lost both of them last year. And I just wanna remember John Pilger and Dan Ellsberg, thank you. Thank you so much, Joe, and you're so right. So the next guest is Kathy Bergen. Now, Kathy's a polymath. Now, I know she likes to hide a light under a bushel. You can really say all of that background put her in preparation for this campaign. She's been with it for 14 and a half years since Dot, yeah? And without her, globally, we wouldn't be as strong as we are. Uh, well, I don't have very many words to say. A lot of words have been said by my, my colleague, Joe Laurier. One thing that I, I do fear is that we are becoming too much like the United States. David Shoebridge said that there are over 300 secrecy laws in Australia. 
Julian Assange is here. Maybe he doesn't even care what happens. Maybe he wants a pardon. Maybe he wants to go back to the United States. Or maybe he doesn't care. Maybe he wants to move on. But if he continues in any way in the same vein, we have to have our secrecy laws worked out. It was pretty clear that it was the person who obtained the documents that had signed a non-disclosure agreement that was under oath or whatever, they were the ones who were indictable, right? And they were the ones who could be charged. But the journalist who has the information plonked on their lap, right? Is it ethical not to publish just because it's classified? What if the leak, if not published, we would all die? Right? Just say there's another Cuban missile crisis. We can imagine that. A leak that must be published to save us all. They're all talking about, oh yeah, there are people who want to harm Australia. But what about people who want to save Australia? It goes to both ends of the spectrum. We have to make it really clear that journalists are here to serve the public, to save the public eventually and that people who sign up to keep secrets, well, they're gonna have problems like David McBride does. And I am so glad that he does because he saw that the law was being broken. And I think that this must be reported. But our journalists need to be safe. And Julian Assange is a journalist and we ought to keep a close eye on all of these laws that are really threatening to prevent journalists from publishing. Remember, the Commonwealth Department of Public Prosecutions advised the AFP that it was not in the public interest to prosecute a journalist that was reporting on war crimes in Afghanistan. My God, Julian Assange published about war crimes in Afghanistan as well, and look what's happened to him. It was terrible, but also David McBride. They worked on the same project, Dan and David. In one case, it wasn't in the public interest to prosecute. In the other, he had no public interest defense. I can see the man who defended him in court. It is totally capricious. We have laws that contradict each other in the United States, in the United Kingdom, and in Australia. We have to make sure that our government straighten things out, that if there is wrongdoing, that if we are in danger, we need to know about it. Okay, thank you. And finally, I have invited all of those street crews, the people who stood in the streets week after week, year after year, yeah. to save Julian Assange. Yeah. I'm so glad that some of you people that have been out there, outside Albo's office, um, in North Sydney, all of you people that, that you have turned up tonight, and we want to hear from you too. Thank you. Thank you, Cathy. I don't know where we'd be without you, mate. I really don't. Now, just give me a moment to catch my breath, because that was an invigorating speech. I've got a few notes I'd like to say about Mark Davis, our next speaker. He's a criminal lawyer and former investigative journalist for ABC's Foreign Correspondent, Four Corners, SBS Foreign Correspondent, and Dateline. He, his thorough investigative journalism work has garnered him five Walkley Awards, including the Gold Walkley, and a Logie. I don't know what he got the Logie for, but I do like it. Um, anyway, because he's thorough, honest, and his programs were exceptional, Julian invited him to the bunker while he was doing the redactions, <laughs> which he can tell you about that himself. So, but also I want to take note of who Mark represents. He represented Coco Violet, the girl, that, the woman, that, the person that was blocking the Harbour Bridge. He represents Stephen Langford, the guy who stuck one of Governor Macquarie's own quotes in an A4 piece of paper on the plinth of that poorly executed statue at the end of Hyde Park. He, Mark represented this guy because Mark, because 
Yeah, I want a round of applause for Mark and Stephen. Stephen was up for malicious damage. He's now in a, f a freedom of speech thing. It's a big issue, yeah? Mark also represented uh, David McBride. So, he's an altruist, and he's up next. So please come, give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Ian. I, I apologise for coming later. I, I just didn't imagine there'd be a pub event at five o'clock until I got a, a call from Stephen, so I'm sorry for coming late. And I'm also sorry if I misread the vibe of the room because I've come here tonight quite happy. Uh, I'm not full of rah-rah. I'm normally full of indignation, but thank God Julian is fucking back on Australian soil. Yeah. You've you got to know when to enjoy your victories because there's few of them. Yeah. And this victory is quite apparent to me. There's never been, a, in my life, a bigger divide between the Australian media and the Australian people. Yeah. The Australian people never turned on, on Julian, ever. The Australian people were delighted to see Julian step off a plane and in the press corps you could just see the pursed lips, you know. <laughs> Why are these people celebrating? They had to ask that question. Well, the fact that they have to ask that question might suggest that they are in fact almost of another class now uh, to what ordinary Australians think. When I first met Julian, he wasn't um, a, a prominent figure. I went, uh, before he invited me anywhere, I went looking for him. And I went looking for him because I'd heard there was a guy from Melbourne, I'm from Melbourne, a guy, activist from Melbourne who was, you know, uh, potentially uh, creating a, a bit of havoc, but he hadn't come to prominence. That attracted me. That attracted me. And when I met him, I, uh, contrary to what you might read about everyone else meeting Julian Assange, I really liked him, right? Really, really liked him. Good man, good company, uh, with a good mission. And it echoed with me. I knew this guy. He'd be here. He'd be here, right? That was the resonance that I had with Julian. He'd be at the Herald Park. And he took on the world. Guy from the Herald Park takes on the world, stands at the, uh, the feet of the, uh, the monster and says, I'm not, I'm not stepping back. And he didn't step back. For 14 bloody years, he didn't step back. I mean, it is, I couldn't have done it. I know, we would have these discussions, actually. I couldn't have done what he did, but he's fulfilled his task. When people keep saying to Julian, what's he gonna do now, you know, day one, what's he gonna do? Julian Assange doesn't have to do another bloody thing in his life, right? Uh, he, he's fulfilled... Uh, he threw himself into the, into the cogs, and the cogs eventually ground to, a, to an end, but he exposed the cogs. So, well done, Julian. God speed to you. Rest. <laughs> Be applauded for the rest of your life. You've done enough. You've done enough, man. Thank you so much, Mark. And I'm so glad you made it here tonight. So now, everybody, the bar is open. Drinks are to be had. We'll be back shortly. Scott Ludlam and Peter Cronow are coming up. But before that happens, where's Mark Davis? Because Mark, yes, yeah, no, just a few words to wrap up what you were saying. He thought I was cutting him off. I thought he'd suddenly finished. Right? I feel really bad about it because he was our opening speaker. He's one of our city's greatest minds. He's an altruistic human being, has a lot of good things to say. Yes, here we go. Thank you, Mark. I really wasn't asking him to come back, but he did rather rudely cut me off. I was just getting going. I, I, there's some schedule I must have missed. As long as you like, mate. Uh, no, like. I won't be as long as I like, but there was, if there was one thing, other thing I wanted to mention, uh, was John Pilger. Uh, uh, heartbreaking, actually. Well, his death was heartbreaking. It took me by surprise. In classic Pilger uh, style, he didn't tell anyone. So I'd seen him and thought, oh, I'll see him again, you know, in six months. And uh, I didn't know he was dying. So it was a, a, a really shocking blow. Uh, John, I'm sure, was important to all of you. He was very important to me. Reached out to me when I was a, a, a young guy and uh, gave me a, a pat on the back, you know. That a, a pat on the back goes a bloody long way when it comes from John Pilter. And it, and it, and it gives you a certain energy, so... 
always remember it. Give some pats. You might be starting something. And uh, <coughs> I saw John. I, I was, had done had been covering Julian for a while, but when he first start, became embroiled in the court processes, this anger of the English media was sort of extraordinary. It took me by surprise. I couldn't quite work out why they thought he was a monster. But they did, almost immediately, th think he was a monster. And at one of the court proceedings, uh, I'm sitting there feeling very alone, really. Like, uh, am, I the only, am I the insane one? What, what are they all so angry about? And they rushed en masse out of the courthouse because the word was Julian was leaving out the back. The mob of journalists running forward. And, I, and this one of the most wonderful moments of my life there's this figure, quite literally, coming the other way, you know, against the stream, <laughs> against the stream and out of the crowd. Comes John Pilger, all flapping with his overcoat and his, uh, and his hair. Mark, wonderful to see you. Let's get you know, <laughs> We went off. It was John Pilger that went against the stream. Who else would come through that crowd? And he kept, kept going for the next 13 years. And uh, I, I really think we all uh, deserve a thought and a prayer for John. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so our next speaker is Scott Ludlam. Now, thank you, Scott, for being able to speak at short notice like that. Now, Scott, you more would know, is a former senator for the Greens. Uh, now, when he was in Parliament, he was possibly the strongest voice and advocate for Julian. Without any further ado, I'm just going to bring him up. Come on. He's, he's Julian's mate. They're good friends. He's been a strong advocate in Parliament. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have parliamentary friends of Assange. Come on. It's worth being here just for the enthusiasm of an intro by Ian Rose. Thank you, Ian. I don't know if anybody celebrated this guy. We were here a couple of minutes late. Like, in terms of stalwart activists behind the scenes doing the work, whether it's glamorous or not, as long as it's necessary, this gentleman has been there from day one. We don't, as Mark said, we don't often get to celebrate. I want to acknowledge that we're here on stolen ground. We're here on the traditional country of the Gadigal people. And I also want to acknowledge and thank all of you here. This campaign has stretched from events like this. We've been to more than a few here in this pub. Events like this around the country and around the world. All the way through to diplomats, lawyers, politicians and presidents. But it starts here. You don't get the president of Mexico without comrades in Mexico doing this kind of work. You don't get Lula da Silva, the president of Brazil, without Brazilian comrades. And you don't get the kind of thing that we saw earlier this year, where the Prime Minister didn't get up and, and give a speech or anything, but supported a motion that Independent Andrew Wilkie and our parliamentary comrades put up. You don't get that without the people who painted this banner, or took these photos, or made those weird costumes, or made the masks made the memes, did the work on the internet. You don't get that kind of campaign without the grassroots. And that's why it's fantastic to be here tonight to see you all. So many familiar faces in the crowd. Without you, you don't ever get these celebrations or these wins. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Julian is free. He's with his family. He's got two adorable kids. And he's just going to stay out of sight. I reckon for as long as he needs, just to stay out of sight. There was a journalist at the press conference in Canberra last week, and it's doing my head in a bit to realise that it was just last week, who asked uh, his wife, Stella, is Julian going back to work? Is he going to be leaking things? Is he going to be putting stuff into the public domain? And she threw it back to them and said, wouldn't it be lovely if you guys started doing that? <laughs> how, about, how about you do your jobs as well? Because Julian's shown them a way. WikiLeaks is celebrated for a couple of things. One of them is the anonymous Dropbox, which a lot of different media outlets use these days. Another one is for the big collaborations, including for some mastheads that we're very happy to throw them under the bus when things got hot. But spread the, the audience and spread the work, spread the load. But one of the other things that I think is a little bit unheralded that they were very good at is that that website became very rapidly unkillable. It was really difficult as they started publishing these enormous troves of information to knock it off the internet. So one of the things that I think the US government and its allies has done in response to not being able to get that source material and rip it offline is surround it with bullshit. As Steve Bannon had said, flood the zone with shit. 
All right, disinformation, just poison the well and put all this other info out there. So I think for us, we have a bit of unfinished business. Julian's done his bit and now it's up to us. Doing things like reforming whistleblower protections. We all know that a person who's missing tonight who would have loved to have been here would be David McBride. He'd be here, he'd have a beer, he'd be here. But he's not, he's in a prison just outside of Canberra. So we have a ton of work to do. But I also feel as though, as far as WikiLeaks is concerned, and that experiment in publishing, what they called scientific journalism, redact, take out any sensitive information or anything that could get someone hurt, and then publish the lot, publish all of it. So that journalists don't get to be gatekeepers. By all means, if you've got expertise, interpret, editorialize, explain to us what's in there, but put the whole corpus of material into view so that we can make our own minds up. We can do the primary reading. And I'm not sure that we have. And this is a bit of a note to self. Apart from collateral murder and the war logs and a, and a handful of headlines, how many of us have really been deep into that archive? And so it's a handful, a handful, not so many of us. And I feel like that's the work that comes next because the source code of the empire that we are beneficiaries and victims of is there, it's out there, it's still live. You can search it in enormous detail. A thing that they published in 2015, a book called The WikiLeaks Files. Who's got a copy of that? If you didn't just raise your hand, hop onto Booktopia or your local friendly bookshop, order a copy of The WikiLeaks Files. They published it in 2015. It's one of the few overviews of the material, of the, sh the overall shape of what is in there, what it tells us about the world that we've inherited and that we can in turn shape. And I want to just finish by quoting one piece, the introduction which was written by Julian Assange. The bulk of the work is written by foreign policy and defence academics from all over the world. It shows you the planet that we live on. It shows you the shape of empire. But the intro is kind of luminous. The writing is incredible and quite funny. Julian's a very good writer. And in it there's one particular quote that stuck with me. He writes, Only by approaching this corpus holistically over and above the documentation of each individual abuse, each localised atrocity, does the true human cost of empire heave into view. And that's the work that remains unfinished, and we're the people to finish it. But tonight we celebrate, and thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Scott. So, our next speaker, Peter Cronow, I've got a few words I'd like to read out. Now tonight, we've been really indulged by some of the premium, premier investigative journalists. Yeah? This is the fourth one that's coming up to the mic tonight, and that's Peter Cronow. He's currently the writer and co-founder of Declassified Australia. He was a successful producer for the ABC TV's investigative documentary program, Four Corners. That's back when Four Corners was decent. You could trust Four Corners for what they were going to say. Peter reports for a, ABC's Radio National uh, Background Briefing, which has to be their preeminent program. Of all, Radio National's got its, its stroke, it's great. The background Briefing is in the top three, if not the top one. It's won heaps of awards. But you know what? He did all that work in the mainstream media, and he saw how it was going. This is my interpretation. And he was a uh, co-founder of Declassified Australia, and maybe even the editor. Come on, Peter, please come down and share your thoughts and insights with the group. Oh, God almighty. Look, I never thought I'd see the day, but I'm seeing it, so it's, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to see everyone coming together. We've got a lot to thank Julian for, because this organisation, this, this coalition of people, all the groups, the thousands and thousands and thousands of them have been brought together by the cause of Julian Assange, which is a unique gift that he's given to us all. The left and progressive people and people concerned about free speech have meandered a little over the years, myself included. But this has been a coalescing event. But it's done one other thing that I think is fucking spectacular. It's shown us the landscape of the enemy. They've stuck their heads above the parapets. The politicians, the bureaucrats, the journalists, the writers, the commentators, the think tanks, they stuck their heads up. They've given us a huge advantage. We know where the struggles now lie. We've seen their techniques. We've seen how they go about demolishing points of view. 
And that should become a really informing point for us all. Now, one example I've got is through uh, Kelly Tranter, who's a fantastic writer, researcher, and lawyer. She's done some terrific articles for Declassified Australia. She's done a heap of FOIs about Julian on DFAT. And, <clears throat> and she's discovered that DFAT didn't put a lot of effort into trying to get the UK to to rethink the appeal and, and perhaps revoke any chance of an extradition. Didn't do a lot of work on contacting Biden's office. Didn't do a lot of work on a whole lot of issues, but did a lot of work. Didn't do a lot of work on a plea deal, but did a lot of work on trying to organise a prisoner transfer from the dungeon in Virginia or wherever the hell he would have ended up. That's the vast amount of the documentation that Kelly's been able to get shows that that's where the concentration of DFAT was going. It wasn't going into stopping him going to the US. It wasn't going into some sort of justice. It was going into, can you please send him back to Australia when you're finished with him? Now, people think, oh, that's shocking. How, how could how DFAT do that to an Australian? Well, it's true to form. The other example, and I was just talking to Mark Davis about this, this of, a, of a defining moment where a great success is had for causes such as Julian Free Speech, Free Press, was the liberation of East Timor. It's a few years ago now, but, but what it showed is that by a constant struggle of people like us, constant reporting, uh, finding out the facts and putting them out there for people to examine and putting pressure on the politicians to make decisions, change can come. So, that same DFAT, who was quite prepared, and I've seen the documents, to allow 130,000 people to die of intentional famine in the first four years of the Indonesian occupation, none of them copped anything. They literally, they went home to their lounge rooms in Canberra, just as the current mob who have overseen what's happened to Julian have done. So we know how they work. We shouldn't sit around and expect the best of them because the best are crushed. The whistleblowers within DFAT are crushed or the Commonwealth Bank <laughs> are crushed, Jeff Morris is there. Um, so I think it's a matter of knowing the terrain, knowing who the people are, knowing who the organisations are and making sure that this gift that WikiLeaks and Julian has given us, far beyond the information of the WikiLeaks site, but an understanding of how power works and how successes can be made against that power. That's the biggest gift that I've taken from Julian and WikiLeaks, and that is it's an empowering gift. We have the power. So, thanks. We do have the power. And that's what it's really all about. We've seen it from so many different points of view, from so many speakers tonight. And the thread is, we've built something. Now, it's only at the primary stage, but it's, 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 it's adolescent. That's what's happened. And it especially happened in the last five years. It really did. That's when it really kicked in. We've got people down there for questions. It's fine. Hang on a sec. What we're going to do is have an open mic. I think what we might do is have Adriana Navarra come up and speak. Now, and Karen, excellent. No, we'll have, they can be together, tandem, however you like. And I'd like these two ladies, I want to tell you something about both of them. They're, they're Team Sydney, uh, Team Assange Sydney. They also work with um, the Town Hall crew. But these are incredible grassroots activists. So. Please make them feel welcome. Bring them up to the microphone. Um, hello, everyone. So we take seriously the fact that we're celebrating. Woohoo! Yeah! Whoa! <laughs> it is a celebration, and it's also an opportunity to say thank you. So um, I'll go first, and uh, Karen will wrap up. What I wanted to first say to you is that this has become a very emblematic symbol of um, the struggle of the community for Julian's freedom. It actually came, I know yellow ribbons were used in the UK before we did here, but this one, this one was designed by one of Tim Assange members, Diane. <laughs> So 
So we have a lot of things to say. The other thing that we should tell you is that many, many years ago, John Shipton rang up a whole lot of friends and um, contacts and put together a group who, of people who did not know each other at all. It's us. We had no knowledge of each other until then, and we met in a meeting at um, Rebecca's and James' house, and from that day onwards, we had a plan. And the plan was that regardless of our um, beliefs and ideas about anything else, we had one thing in common, and it was freedom of the press, free speech, and Julian Assange. It was just the one cause that we had. And we agreed on making all our work as a community group that, nothing else. The other thing we found is that we have very little to thank politicians. There was very little support for the community at the time. The support came basically from the Greens and some independents. In fact, our prime minister um, is not one of my favorite people. He was very rude. His office was very rude to community members. In fact, completely inappropriate in the manner in which they handle pressure from their own community. Um, we created links with people from the Greek uh, groups in Marrickville, from uh, the Arabic community in Marrickville, and just people who went past our rallies, and we would ask them to go and speak to the staff of Prime Minister Albanese, and they did not take that lightly. They, they were quite upset about that. And so again, I think that was uh, being persistent, being a pest, being there every week was something very important for us. Here, here, that's what made it happen. It was that week in, week out, <laughs> year in, year out, that made it happen. Albanese wouldn't have got where he got if it wasn't for people like Karen and Adrian. Yay. So let's so, really let that be known. You might not know, but uh, we were not only at Marrickville and outside the US consulate, but we walked the streets of Sydney. We were at Bondi, we were at Manly, we were everywhere <laughs> once a week uh, with our banners and our flyers, just talking to people and giving them information and us educating ourselves so that we could answer any question they had. We became the speakers. We didn't mind that we didn't have anyone, uh, any personality to speak with us. We became the speakers. And I'd like to say that there we had Mike, Nick, Joyce, Stephen, Mark, Rebecca, James, and so many other people who were wonderful, and they were just members of the community who became the speakers for Julian Assange in Sydney. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. The last thing is that we, what we did is we made use of our talents. So, for example, Diane is fantastic at writing letters, very sharp. She would write letters to the editor all the time. Then we had um, Abigail, an artist, she prepared these banners, and we were behind the banners of Abigail. Um, we had Karen, Karen was excellent with the placards. All of those are Karen's job. We were also, I suppose, um, uh, we initiated a lot of the communications internationally with groups. We worked with Italian groups, with uh, Brazilian groups, um, Argentinian, Mexican, um, German groups as well, and of course the UK uh, in support of Assange, and we created this network and we fed each other information. We were there on the phone constantly. We learned how to use, how to, yes, use Twitter. We learned how to use Facebook. We did all of that because we believed that this was a fundamental issue for Australian society, both the protection of journalism and also the protection of, a, of an Australian and a family man. That was our task. I finish by saying that I'm very grateful to our families because we put so much time into this week in and week out, and we couldn't have done this without the support of our partners, our kids, and so forth. So thank you, thank you, thank you.
I just wanted to say what a wonderful night, what a wonderful couple of weeks it's yeah. been. Um, I really didn't think this day would come. I thought I would be on the streets of Marrickville waving at cars saying, honk for Julian, honk for Julian. We need to get this man out of jail. And the day did come. So thank you to my husband who put up with me every week, <laughs> three times a week or more out on the street. It was worth it, wasn't it? So thank you everyone for all your support. Thank you. I tell you what, it, it really is, and I must say it again, it is because people like those two women that just spoke right now, and there's a whole lot of you here in the room and you know of others, that week in, week out, when Albo was talking with the US, because remember what happened was, it was the Australian government talking to the US government and WikiLeaks talked to the US government. WikiLeaks and the Australian government, according to both of them, said they couldn't talk to each other really, they had to do it all through the US. Yeah? It is only because Abo is saying to the US, he's saying, this is putting a strain on our alliance. This can't go on for any longer. He said that, I saw that, that that's a pretty much a direct quote. I'm speculating, he would have also said, I've got people outside my office every week picketing. You've got people outside your consulates and every embassy every week picketing. We've got them in the town square, the town hall every week picketing. Yeah? That is what gave him that leverage. So, as well as all these legal people saying, look, this is legally da di da you had all of that going on. I do want to do a bit of a shout out to, to Diane. I first met Diane in 2011 when we formed Support Assange and WikiLeaks Coalition. And I tell you what, that woman has the world record for letters to the editor being published. I really and truthfully, a month does not go by where Diane Davey is not in the... Yeah, letters to the editor. And I do want to do a shout out to a particular person. This is, this is for the Sydney movement in its early days. And that's Christine Keaveney. Now she organised a bus trip to Canberra. Christine Assange, and this is when Obama was here. Christine Assange called her up and said, look, can I join you? If you think about it, he was the one that exposed yeah. all of it. Yeah. And his neck's on the line. None of ours, none of us. He's going to be in a US prison being tortured. Okay, let's get real about it. We all go down there. It was on the bus trip back that we formed, and it was pretty much at Christine's suggestion, Christine Assange, we formed Support Assange and WikiLeaks Coalition, the only Sydney community group until he was thrown in jail. And I've got to say yet another big thank you to the town hall crew, your support, the Assange team Sydney, and people for Assange, that we, we, we three-folded it. We became one to four, yeah? And that happened all around the world. So, Christine, can you come and say a few words? Um, I'm actually on my way back to Wollongong, where I now live, for my sins. <laughs> what an extraordinary week it's been. All we need now is a ceasefire in Palestine. Yeah! I'm on my way. Thank you to everybody for coming. Thank you particularly to Kathy for organising this, an extremely talented human being. All the incredibly talented, intelligent and compassionate human beings who've been part of this campaign. Well, WikiLeaks is an essential part of the fourth estate. This was known because of WikiLeaks. No offence involved in publishing that material on WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks is a source unlike any other. One of the big questions about WikiLeaks and Julian Assange has been, is he a journalist? Amongst my peers in the archives and library world, I'm certainly not alone in supporting the work of WikiLeaks. I was not just disappointed, but actually shocked by the attitude of Julia Gillard and her government. I think that WikiLeaks is a purer form of journalism than much of the journalism that we have today. You don't need WikiLeaks work. What you need is honest commentary. Yeah. Not just, I'm not going to do it, but you're not going to do it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Christine. I just want to thank a few other people around the country, including the late Ross Herman, filmmaker and extraordinary activist with the Breakout Mob and Prisoners Action Group and a million other causes, who died two weeks ago. Yvonne Francis, who ran for the Nuclear Disarmament Party after Peter Garrett abandoned it, just to keep the name current. She ran a shop, a cafe, Yvonne's Cafe, down in Apollo Bay for the last 25 years, saving the wilderness down there. She got over 15,000 signatures on a petitions for Assange outside her little cafe in Apollo Bay. 15,000 signatures. She should not be forgotten. I just want to personally thank Kathy for putting up with my 300 phone calls telling her what to do over the last 10 years. And my question to either Kathy or John is taking into account the backlash through Sky Media, Daily Telegraph, Sydney Morning Herald, ABC, and the rest of them since Assange was released. I want a specific answer to Jacqueline Malley from last week's Sydney Morning Herald, which got three letters praising it over the split in the Assange movement over the alleged rape of two women in Sweden by Julian Assange. Now, this is important because the two left-leading groups in Melbourne are still taking the pseudo-feminist line and Clementine Ford, radical feminist with 200,000 Facebook followers and Twitter followers, is supporting Assange against them. But I'd like to ask John or Cathy the truth of the issue of why the Swedes didn't go to the Ecuadorian embassy to get Assange's statement. The truth of the issue that the two women who originally were roped into claiming they had been raped have since backtracked. And the truth of the issue of the Crown Prosecutor in Sweden having direct links to the CIA by political contacts because they're the three errors that Jacqueline Mackey put in her article in the Herald last week. Thank you so much for raising that issue. Now, I'm going to be succinct. Three things. When it happened, you had Naomi Wolf, who was the world's preeminent expert on victims of rape. Like, that, that, that is her title. That's her job title. That's her experience. She wrote an article called The Hearing Cues and a follow-up one. Back at the time, read them both. She said this is a political thing. Women Against Rape came out and said the same thing. Code Pink came out and said the same thing. Now, I actually got counselled of a sort by young Greens. I'm a member of the Greens Party. Because I wanted to talk about, you know, we've got an event on tomorrow. Julian was kicked out of the embassy last night. Let's all go to it. Oh, no, you can't post here. He's a rapist, they were telling me. And I'm going, well, have a look at these. Oh, no, it still carried on. So some people are suckers for the Daily Mail, and we can't help that. But the thing is, it didn't happen. SW refused to sign any of their documents. SW's consent has been abused for 14 and a half years. She's in hiding. Nobody knows if she's really alive. I hope that answers that question. Cathy's going to look after the mic for a while. I'm sick of my voice. I'm sure you are. Yes. Uh... <laughs> Ian asked me to look after the mic for a while, but he's, uh, he's like a, a jack-in-the-box. First of all, I'd like to say that I have been in the courtroom for Julian Assange since 2019, reporting live from the courtroom. I have also been in the courtroom for David McBride, and I will be in the courtroom for David McBride's appeal, which is upcoming. If you see the crowdfunder for that, they need to raise a bit of money, please help him out. So I just wanted to know if there was anyone else who has something to say. Other... Can you answer my question about the Ecuadorian embassy and why the Swedish didn't go there to get a statement off Julian? Uh, <clears throat> well, so the 
Chief Justice Stefan Linskog of Sweden said that there was no reason, no legal reason why the Swedes could not go to London to take a statement from Julian Assange. It was also possible to use mutual legal assistance, which was a system whereby they could do it um, online. Now, we also know, we have also heard that the Crown Prosecution Service were exchanging emails with this, the Swedes under the direction of Keir Starmer, who has just become the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, under his watch. And we had these freedom of information requests from the Italian journalist Stefania Morizzi that revealed that the UK was telling Sweden not to come and not to shut down the case. The Swedes wanted to shut down that case in 2013 and the British wanted it continued. They wanted to perpetuate Julian's limbo at the Ecuadorian embassy. In fact, that case stagnated for five years. And we also have the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention saying that he was arbitrarily detained. So I would recommend, and this is something that Ian didn't mention, I would recommend that you read Nils Melser's The Trial of Julian Assange, right? <laughs> Nils Melser is a professor of law. He was fluent in Swedish, and so he went and looked at all of the papers. Nils Melser counted 50 violations of due process in Sweden in order to keep Julian Assange in the embassy. Why? Because the Americans wanted him, because the CIA wanted him. The CIA were going to, wanted to kidnap or kill him. I mean, it's all kind of <laughs> failed. It's spectacularly failed. We have him back, and I think this is a good thing, and I think we have to protect him. So, <laughs> you got your question answered. Can I, can I hear from you? Yes, please, come. Oh, it's a question? Billy Field should be congratulated for all the town hall meetings. Oh, yes, yes. There have been some remarkable artists. Billy Fields had a high profile in the community as a pop star and a music man totally unfiliated with politics, but he was there many, many times. I'm sure you all know. He was at Town Hall. He was faithful to the cause. I don't know where he is now. I don't know him, but I just think he should be celebrated because he was a real, very staunch person. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I'd like to say is that what's great about the release of Julian Assange at this point in time is that what's happened since he's been detained and since this time has passed there's been a huge blossoming of alternative media in America, Australia, all over the world. And Joe Laurier is part of all that, but uh, obviously a veteran uh, much earlier, but it's really blossomed. Most people are not listening to the ABC anymore. They're not listening. People are not watching it. More and more people are watching podcasts for news. They don't believe these people anymore. The game's up. And Julian started that. It was Julian who fucking gave it to him in the first place. An Australian. An Australian person. You know, we should be so proud of this man. He's, a, he's got the real Australian spirit. The old rebel yell of, the, of Ned Kelly and all the rest of it. The Gerildery letter. You know, it's, it's, people forget all this stuff. But Julian's got it. He encapsulates Australia. And the old Australian rebellious spirit, and good on him. And um, I just wanted to say that since that time too, okay, so we had this blossoming of alternative media. I don't know if everybody's aware of this, but, you know, there's been this huge awakening amongst the American defence fraternity, community, whatever you want to call it, the people who's... All those southerners, for instance, whose sons go to war in the Middle East wars. They thought they were fighting the ISIS. They thought they were fighting Al-Qaeda. They thought they were fighting all these jihadis, jihadi central. Let's kill all these Muslims. 
Now they know that their own government had supported and, and, and nurtured these groups and set them up. Do you know how those mothers feel now? I mean, only Putin understands mothers. Putin has a dinner table. He brings them all into the Kremlin. He's scared of them, right? Putin's scared of the mothers of soldiers. What's happening now in America is that all these mothers are realising that their sons died for a lie, which is what Julian's always said. He always said it was a lie, and they, went to, they, they died for this lie. And these mothers now know. And I tell you what, there's going to be a reckoning in America from those mothers. You know, all those, especially those southern mamas, right? Those babushkas from the south, they're going to give it to them. They know that they died for a lie. They know that they were misled. They know that their own government fostered these so-called insurgents against their own country. <laughs> they lost, you know, important members of their family. Yeah, this, this, this has an effect. And it might, take, it might take a whole generation to filter down, but it's going to have an effect. And Julian was part of that. What he did with the, those, you know, those famous videos that were on TV all the time, that started, that was like an explosion. But now, all the people who need to know, know. You know, so letting him out now, as, you know, they knew they were going to lose that appeal, they let him out. But they know that everybody already knows now. There's nothing to hide anymore because everybody's getting their information from somewhere else. So I think we're on a roll. Well, I think we've got one more person that has... Uh, how many more people have want to say something? Oh, that's fantastic. We've got time. We've got time. It's don't your forget, time. Don't forget Dennis Aubrey's song, A Dirty Little War. Dirty Little, Dirty little secret. secret. Yes, yeah. I know that one. <laughs> What's your name? Graham, Graham Scott Smith Before. from Blue Mountains for the Sound. Before. This is Graham Scott Smith from Blue Mountains for a Sound. <laughs> Hi. Look, I'd like to thank Kerry Lee from Blue Mountains for Assange, who's done an amazing job uh, in the mountains to uh, pull us all together and do a lot of work to uh, have lots of demonstrations and uh, support for Julian over the years. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the World Socialist website, who has produced nearly 2,500 articles on uh, on Julian Assange and the persecution of Julian Assange and was there from the beginning. Uh, and the Socialist Equality Party of Australia has been uh, campaigning for Assange uh, since 2010 and since his, uh, pers the beginning of his persecutions. Uh, and one of the rallies uh, in 2019, I think, or 18, was uh, John Pilger spoke at. So I think it's important to acknowledge, you know, the role of the World Socialist website and how they have been supporting Julian Assange from the beginning. Thank you. OK, so Julian is now free and we all fought and blah, 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 and that's fantastic. But now what are we doing with David McBride? Because I haven't heard anything about him. Is he there to just rot and we just keep quiet because I'll answer that real quick. Julian Assange is free? That's lovely, his first one. Let's go for the others. Thank you. OK, look, I'll answer that real quick. David's in, in jail, as many of you know. He's got his campaign going. But for tonight, we're not going to go down that path. Tonight, we want to hear stories from everybody, as we did from Christine, as we did from Adriana, as we did from Karen, the grassroots people that were doing stuff, whether it was letter writing, being on the street, or whatever. Tonight is your opportunity to come up and say something. And if you don't, I'll bore you with stories because I've got heaps of them. So come on, everybody. You had your hand up earlier. Are you going to speak about your experience and how you feel about the win? Yeah? That's what, that's what we want to hear. We want to hear what... No. no, I'm not talking about that. I don't believe Julian Assange is free because the US government just decided to do the right thing. I don't believe... Julian Assange is free due to the efforts of the Australian government. 
I believe Julian Assange is free because it has become clear to the parasite class that ordinary men and women are becoming truthfully informed. I believe that the parasite class could see the beginnings of the absolute unity and determination Julian recognized as being necessary to overthrow the oppression. I believe the parasite class had to have Julian released to try to take the wind out of our sails. But the Julian Assange movement is a movement of truth and conscious unity. It is important that we stand firm, keep fighting, keep standing with Julian and his principles, and we will free the world. Okay, there, were, there was someone up the back there. Can you? Yes, come on. No, we won't film you. My background is Iranian. On behalf of Iranian women and all Middle Eastern women, we should say thank you to Julian for wonderful work that he has done. In, please do not film me, okay? Please. We should say thank you to Julian for all what, what he has done for us. We Iranian, at the same time that we are fighting against the brutal barbaric Islamic regime, at the same time we are fighting against the brutal U.S. and all war criminals that they, are, they have destroyed our countries, they have destroyed the whole Middle East, and we have to continue to fight. As long as the, there, is, there is war in the Middle East, we cannot have any freedom anywhere in the world. I have been involved in tens of different campaigns, including the Julian's one. I have been one of the main members of the I am Bradley Manning campaign. At that time it was Bradley Manning and not uh, Chelsea. So, um, also in different kinds of refugees, women's rights, children's rights, helping homeless day and night, very active member of the Occupy Sydney, which was the greatest movement in, in Australia, and that was the most beautiful time of my life in exile. That because of brutality of Islamic regime, tens of millions of Iranians had to leave the country, and this is a kind of genocide against us. So, what I would like to say is that we do not need to, to say thank you to Albanese government. He hasn't done enough for Julian. If he really wanted to do something for Julian, at the, at, the, at the first day that he came to power, and before making that billions of dollars of deal with US imperialism, he should have made the condition under free Julia, Julian Assange, English is my fourth language, sorry for any... <laughs> So, he should make the condition before making those billions of dollars of, of deal with U.S. imperialists, he should have said, free Julian Assange first, and then we do some deal. Yeah. And, and, also, and also, for so many years, tens of years of suffering, someone's greatest journalist in the earth, like Julian, so many years of suffering, of torturing, of all brutality that they have done to this gentleman and his family. They, may, they should do tens, hundreds of millions of dollars as a compensation to this brave man. This is something that nobody is talking about. And, and also at the same time that he is free, but I think this is free Julian Assange still, we should say that, because he still is not free to talk. We believe, we guess that they are trying to silence him. At least for a, for a certain time, of, uh, um, certain period of the time, to silence him, not to talk to us. We want Julian to be purely, purely free. Free from everything. Free from all these war criminals, free from all these torturing, imprisoning, and all what they have done to him just because defending our beautiful people in the beautiful part of the Middle
doing this. Yeah, Thank yeah, you yeah, so, much. so much. I want to answer something that she oh, said. Thank you, Joe. Please. Unfortunately, uh, the agreement Julian signed indemnifies the U.S. It cannot sue them for any compensation. However, he didn't agree to that with the United Kingdom. So the facts of the matter are Julian and his team and the Australian government were all in negotiations for a long time. It was kind of sealed about a year ago after the Belmarsh Tribunal in Sydney that so many of us enjoyed. But the sticking point, from what I understand, was Julian not having to go to the US to sign the deal. Clearly they worked it out. They put it on US soil in an island up north between New Guinea and Japan. What's more important, and this is why the WikiLeaks themselves, their leading campaign, and I really want everybody to notice this, it's pardon Assange. Right? He agreed to all that stuff, but once he's pardoned, that's it. See, for Chelsea Manning, her sentence was only commuted, which is why Trump and Pompeo were about to throw her in jail, and they're saying, incriminate Julian. Say that he, he, he drew you to make these drops. And you know what Chelsea said? She said, I'm not going to lie. You put me in jail if you want. Yeah? Now that's integrity. That is integrity. Yeah? And, uh, but her sentence was only commuted. But if her sentence was pardoned, they wouldn't have been able to open that door at all. Which is why WikiLeaks is saying we really all have to be working on the Pardon Assange campaign. That's how we, that's how we counteract all those agreements. Look, he should be paid compensation, but if I was him, I wouldn't be spending my time looking for it. You know, others can do that. He doesn't need to be doing that. He's got to go and have a life. If my speculation is it's at least three years after not having freedom of movement for 14 and a half, not seeing sunlight for nearly just a bit over 13, for not being in company with other people for five. I mean, really and truthfully, that, that guy's metal has been tested. And look at him. He came off the plane like a champion. He had his fist raised high and he walked straight out. But we have to give him those years, however long it is for him, to decide before he comes back into the room. All right? We really do that. Now, there were a couple of things I wanted to say before we wrapped up, but I think I've lost my thread. So, we're going to wrap up tonight. Thank you, everybody, so much for participating. Uh, and I do want to... I've got one quick story. At two in the morning, Cathy received a text saying, your bump in time has been pushed out to 4.30. Yeah. Now, normally it's two hours for Cathy to sit up and for us to dress the room. And we were going to, because it's a celebration, take three hours and do it leisurely. We had to convert that into 45 minutes. We, we stretched it from 30 to 45. And I want everybody to put a big hand of applause for, look at this room, look what these folks did in 40 minutes. And I've got Karen here. Come on, Karen. I'm sorry, just really quickly, uh, Emma, who's been with us since the beginning, um, I'm really sorry we forgot to mention you, but you're at home sick, so get better too, Emma, thank you. Come back to this movement, it's going to grow. We've just got out of primary school, we're hitting high school, folks, so let's do it. Thank you and good night.